Hey, what's up YouTube? My name is Brett and today I'm gonna to teach you guys how to do data fetching inside of Next.js 13's app router. So you're gonna learn everything you need to learn to fetch data using Next.js 13. But also before we get started, if you could hit that like button and also subscribe for more content just like this, that would be greatly appreciated. But let's just jump right into it. So before we get started, with the actual coding, we are going to go over the Next.js 13 docs using the app router. So make sure this is selected as using app router here at the top left. So I'm inside the data fetching section and they give us four main recommendations when fetching data. So we're going to go over them really quickly. So number one is we should fetch data on the server using server components. So by default, Next.js 13, all the pages, the files, the layouts are server side rendered. So the only time a page isn't server-side rendered is if you mark the top of the page with the string saying use client. And the only reason why you would mark a page with a use client is because there's interactivity on the page or you're using a React hook like use state or use effect. The second recommendation Next.js offers us is that we should fetch data in parallel to minimize waterfalls and reduce loading times. So that means it's going to fetch two separate endpoints at the same time and this will make sure that the data loads at the same time while reducing the time it takes to actually load the data. The third recommendation is for layouts and pages, we should fetch data where it's used. Reason being is Next.js will automatically dedupe the request in a tree. This means after we recall a fetch request the first time, it will automatically cache the request inside of a temporary cache and this will make it easier for us to actually fetch the data next time we need it. So whenever we need to fetch data, you should always call it where needed because it will be stored in a temporary cache that is easily and readily available. So now that we've gone over the four main recommendations for fetching data, let's open up our terminal so we can actually create our Next.js 13 project. So I am going to go on my Windows desktop and I'm going to open up my terminal. I am going to change directories into where I keep all of my code and you should do the same thing. And then we are going to run the command npx create dash next dash app at latest. This will prompt us to a few questions that we need to answer to start our project. First one is what is the project name? I'm going to say data fetching video. We're not going to use TypeScript, so no. No to ESFlint, yes to Tailwind CSS, no to the source directory, yes to the app router, and no to customize the default import alias. It's going to initialize the project, and it's also going to install all the dependencies necessary for the project. This should take about 15 seconds. And then after this is completed, we could change directories back into the project that we named it, which is data fetching video and then you can type code dot and this will open up my vs code editor which is my text editor and you could close the terminal as well and now we are ready to actually start coding but before we actually start doing any code let's clean up some files to make sure everything is ready to work so inside of the app directory we're going to go inside the global css and we will remove lines 5 through 27 and leave lines one through three since we will use Tailwind CSS to style a few things. The layout.js file is totally fine. We can leave it as is. And then the page.js, which is your home page, we can remove everything inside of the return. And then we will have a div. And then inside the div, let's do an h1 saying home. And we can remove this import of image at the top. Okay, so everything is set and ready to go. But before we go and do that, I'm gonna show you where we are gonna fetch data from. So the website is called dog.co forward slash dog dash API forward slash. So what this does is it's a pretty much a dummy data fetch practice that we could use to fetch data. Here's the fetch request and every time we click the button, it will fetch a new image of a dog. And there is a specific reason why I'm using this API. Later on in the tutorial, we're gonna to use a different API called the JSON placeholder. You've probably seen it from other YouTubers and different tutorials. It's a very useful API dummy data as well for the internet. But we are gonna use this API for our first fetch request, which we are going to fetch data on our server component. 
So when making fetch requests, you do want to organize your code inside different directories, like a utils folder where all your functions should be. But for this specific API call to the dog API, we are going to call this in the home page because we are going to use, like I said, the JSON placeholder API in a little bit. So like I said before too, every page is server side rendered and we could actually call the fetch request inside of the page. But before we do that, let's run the development server. So you're gonna do an NPN run dev. It's gonna open up on localhost 3000. And all it should say on our page is the H1 that says home, it's here at the top left. So let's just style this a little bit before we get started. We are using Tailwind CSS, so we'll put the text center. And the H1, let's have a class name of text 5XL, font bold. And let's give some margin top as well of 20. So let's just look at it real quick. And we have home right there, cool. So now let's make a fetch request to this endpoint. So let's copy this endpoint. And let's create our function up here. And the function we will call, we will call a get dog, get dogs, because that is what we're doing. So it's gonna be async function, and it's gonna call get dogs. And the first thing we are going to do is we are going to create a variable called response because we want the response. And the response is going to await a fetch to that endpoint that I copied. And it is going to be inside of a string. So copied a little more than I wanted, but there is the right endpoint URL. And after we get the response, we need to create it as a JSON. So we're going to wait the response as a .json and we'll store it in the data variable. And then we can return it as data. And then down here, we could just actually call that function. So we could say cons dogs equal await get dogs and then call the function. And then this has to be an async function because we're awaiting some data. So now we could use dogs inside of our JSX down here below the return. And before we do that, we could actually just do a console log. So we can actually console log dogs and see what we get. And since it is a server side page, it's gonna show up inside of our actual terminal here in our code. So as you can see here, we get a message and the message is the image and the status is success and that we get a request of 200. Okay, cool. So that means that is working and we are actually retrieving dog images. Like I said, below the H1, we could do a image tag. And if we do an image tag, this is a component inside of Next.js, we need to import at the top from next last image. This takes in a few properties. So the source is going to be dogs.message. And the reason why is because if you look at the console that we got right here, it says the message and the message is the actual um, image URL. So that's why it's dogs.message. And then we must give it a width and a height. And then we must give it an alt. And the alt could just be dogs. And then let's give it another property called priority. Okay. So I'm just going to show you what it's going to show me. It's going to throw an error and I'll explain why. So if we go to our local 3000, we get an error because we are trying to fetch a image from this URL. And it's pretty much telling us that it's not configured inside of our next.config.js file. And it's pretty much like we don't trust this source. And if you do trust the source, put this in your next.config.js file. So let's go back to our code. We go to the next.config file. Inside of the object, we are gonna say images. And then inside of that, we'll have an object with domains. And the domains will be an array with a string. And it should be images.dog.ceo. So that is the URL we are fetching, images.dog.ceo, perfect. And then we could just put a comma behind this. 
And then let's just run our server again. So npm run dev. We will open up localhost 3000. And then since we are fetching the data with the image, with the image component, now we get a dog. So now we're actually fetching data successfully. But the main reason why I wanted to fetch data from this dog API is because technically, if you go back to the API, every time you fetch data, it gives you a new dog. So then if we refresh our page here, we get the same dog. So you would think the API isn't working or your code isn't working. But if you look at the Next.js docs, every fetch request is cached inside of a temporary cache and it just keeps fetching that same data. So that means we need to give an option to our fetch request saying we don't want you to store the data in a cached folder and we want to get new data endpoints every time, like new data. So we could close this config file and it is very simple to do. So right behind the fetch endpoint, we are going to have an object and inside the object, we will have a cache and we're just going to say the cache, we want it to be no cache. So this means every time we do not want to cache the actual data and we want to fetch a new response every time. So let's now refresh the page and we get a new dog every time. So that is a very specific, easy point to get around when fetching data. But like you said, every fetch request stores data in a temporary cache. So you need to make sure if you don't want it stored, you need to have the option that says no cache. So let's clean up our code a little bit and let's remove all of the dog API because we don't need it anymore. So we can remove the initialization of the function, remove the actual function itself, remove the image, and remove the end port. Okay, so now let's start actually um, organizing our project so we could actually start using the JSON placeholder API. So I know we are going to use the user's API endpoint inside of the dummy data. So I am right here going to have a link component from next slash link. So we have to import at the top and we are going to go to a user's page which we have not curated yet and we'll create right now. So we're gonna say go to users. And then let's do a closing tag of the link to close it. And then let's create this users segment right here inside of our app folder. So all you have to do is create a new folder inside the app directory and we must call a users because that will be the path name. And then inside the path name, we need a page.jsx file or a tsx file, whatever you're using. And then we can do RFC. And if you don't know what the RFC is, these are snippets and they are done by the extension ES7. So all you have to do is download the ES7 snippet right here and you will be able to type code faster and more efficiently. We could also change the function name from page to users page because that is what we are doing on this page. And we could keep this as page for now. And we could go back to our actual localhost 3000, click go to users. And as you can see, we're on the users page and it just says page. Okay, cool. So let's style this page a little bit more. Let's just put users as H1. The parent div will have text center margin top 20. The users will be a text of 5XL and font bold. Okay, so now let's go to Google Chrome and let's get out of the dog API and let's just type in JSON placeholder. So it should be the first you saw. It's called typeycode.com and it is a free fake REST API. And if you scroll down when we get on the page, you'll be able to see the resources that we could actually request from. So these are endpoints we could request from. It could either be posts, comments, albums, photos, to-dos, or users. Like I said, we are going to use the user's endpoint and it should give us back 10 different users in JSON format. So if we click it, we get users with different properties like name, username, email, address, and much more. And there's 10 of them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this endpoint, which is where we wanna fetch the request from. 
and we just have it now ready to go. And like I said, now we want to create a function so we could use it inside of the user's page. So we are going to organize this a little better and inside of the app, we are just going to create a libs folder and this is where all of our functions are going to be. So the first one is going to say get users dot JSX. We could do a react functional component and then it could just be called get users. That's perfect. So inside of this code block, we want to get a response from that awaited fetch data. And since we're using await, this must be an asynchronous function. We were going to fetch the data from that endpoint we just copied from JSON placeholder, which is that right there. And then we need to do a check to see if we're actually getting response. So we're going to say if the response is not OK, we should throw a new error and stop the code right away saying fail to fetch users. And then if we pass that check, we need to return the response as a JSON. So right here is our code. And what we're fetching is static data on a server component. So the reason why it's static is because there's always going to be 10 users every time we fetch it. So we can store it in our temporary cache. So we don't need any options behind this. So next, we do want to go to the users page, which we created here. And we actually want to import that function from the libs get users.jsx file. So we're going to import get users from lib slash get users. And now we just need to call the function inside of the users page. So we're going to hook it up to a users variable and we're going to await the get users. And then we got to turn the function to asynchronous. Perfect. Now, after we have the H1 saying users right below that, so we can make sure we're fetching the users. We want to map through all the users. So we're going to say users dot map. And then we're going to say each user. We want to return and then we need a div, which the div is going to be the parent div or we could do empty fragment. And then inside of this, we could have a P tag. And then the P tag needs a key since we're mapping through everything and the key needs to be unique, which will be user.id. And then inside of the user.id, we could just display the user's name. And then we could close We should be able to close this and this. Okay, so now everything is closed and ready to go. We're mapping through all the users and all we're returning is the user.name. So we could check out the code real quick on our local host. And it's saying users is not defined. It's because I named it user and not users. So let's look at it again. And then as you can see here, we get all of the users from that fetch API endpoint. So now that we successfully fetched all of the users, I did style it up a little bit. So before I say that, let me show you what I did. I just added on the P tag with the key, a class name of text three XL and a margin top of 10. So now that we have successfully fetched all of the users, we want to fetch the specific information for each user when we click on it. So that means we have to fetch dynamic data. And the way you fetch dynamic data inside of Next.js 13 is inside of a folder, there needs to be another folder. And this folder is going to be in bracket notation. So we need brackets and what's ever side, what is ever inside of the brackets, that is going to be the params. So the parameters that we pass to that specific page. So for me, 
the parameters have to be unique and they're only custom to that specific user. So I'm gonna use ID. So as you can see there, the parameter we use is ID. And then this dynamic page needs to have a page.jsx. So now we could actually fetch dynamic data and display it on this dynamic route. So we have to fetch each individual user. And the way we are gonna do that is if we go back to our jsonplaceholder.com.typecode, as you can see here, if we go to say slash users, the pram, we could do like ID of three and that should give us the third user. So it's slash user slash three. So this number is dynamic and it is always changing. So it might be seven if we click seven, it could be six, it could be 10, it could be whatever number. So that number could always be changing. So we have to fetch the data dynamically. So I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. So I'm just gonna copy this. This will be our endpoint for our dynamic fetch. And we must create another function. And where we're gonna create this function is in our libs folder. And we are gonna call this get user.jsx. And we're just getting one user. And what we're gonna do here is we have to export default. And it'll be an async function called get user. And we're gonna pass in the ID into this function. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna get a response And this is going to be from the fetch request. And since we know it's dynamic data, data, we need to use the template literal. So that means backticks instead of strings. And inside of that, we could paste that URL. And like I said, it's not always going to be seven. It could be anything from one through 10. So we need the money sign and then brackets and then the pram, which is ID that we're passing in. So this could be dynamically changing. Now let's check to see if the response is okay, because if it's not okay, let's just stop the code and throw an error saying that we failed to fetch the user. So that means we know that this endpoint didn't work and we know where the problem occurred. And so then right below that, let's just return the response as a JSON. And then let's close the code with one more bracket. Okay, so this is our get user function inside of our libs folder. So we are exporting this because we need to import it inside of our dynamic route, which is the bracket with the ID. So let's import that. So we're gonna say import the get user function from the libs slash get user. Okay. So let's display their information. So we're gonna create a async function called the user page. And we have to pass in the params inside of this page like this. So we're gonna destructure it and we're gonna say params and the params is gonna be destructured into the ID because that is what we defined here inside of the brackets. So now we're passing the params successfully. What we need to do now is we need to actually call the function get user. So to do that, we can name this user data, and this will await the get user passing in the ID. Okay, so now we could just re use the return and start writing some JSX. And inside the return, we could have a parent div that wraps everything. And inside of this, we could just give this an H1 that says user data dot name because that is going to be the user data name. And then let's close the whole code block with this block right here. So let's test everything out to make sure everything is working correctly and we're actually getting data dynamically. So let me go back to the home page. We're on a little close 3000. We click go to users and then we get all the users. Now if we click, well actually, we're not gonna be able to click anything because we need to make them clickable. So we have to go back to the users page, not the dynamic page, but the actual slash users. And as you can see here, the p tag, there's no link to it. 
So we need to actually surround the p tag or inside the p tag with a link. So we can do it inside and we need the link component and we need to import at the top. And then we need a href that is going to be a dynamic route to slash users slash user dot ID. And then we just need to close the link tag so we can actually navigate to that page. So whatever name they click on, it's gonna give us the ID and then it's gonna show us that information again. So let's go back to our page. We will go to localhost 3000, go to users. And if we click say Chelsea Dietrich, as you can see here, it says Chelsea Dietrich. So let's try to make sure it works. Let's click Irvin. See, it says Irvin Howe. Leanne, it says Leanne Graham. So we are going on dynamic pages. And if you do click it, you see Clement Bosch and it says here the URL slash user slash three. And the only reason why it's showing the name is because if we go to our dynamic page, all we are displaying is user data dot name as an H1. So bang, that is how you do dynamic data fetching inside Next.js 13 Zap Router. Next thing I want to show you is I want to show you how you guys could fetch data in parallel. To fetch data in parallel, we want to fetch data from two different endpoints at the same time. And this, like it says in the docs, it will help reduce the load times, but it also show both data endpoints at the same time, which can actually cause a problem because maybe if somebody's computer is slower, you won't see that data until both actual endpoints are resolved, the promise. So let's go back to our typeycode.com. And if we go back to our resources and routes, I want to get the user's post for each individual user. So we need to actually fetch that dynamically as well. And this time it's gonna be a different URL. So as you can see here, this request right here, this get is getting the post ID, which equals one. So we're gonna have the user ID. So it's gonna be slash post slash user ID, no slash post question mark post user ID equals, and then the dynamic data. I'll show you exactly how it's written out. I don't know if I explained that the best, but let's call a function one more time. So like I said, this function is going to call the post for each individual user. And we want to fetch this data in parallel with the user data. So let's create another function, which we will call get user post dot JSX. And then this get user post, like what it says, we are getting the user post. So we're going to export default async function and we will call this get user post we are going to pass in the id as a param and then inside of this code we are going to set a response equal to the await and then actually as you can see here my github copilot actually correctly coded it so it's, we're going to fetch it from the JSON placeholder .com slash post. And then the parameter is we're going to get the post of the specific ID that is dynamically passed in of the user ID. So that is the endpoint we are fetching from. And then we need to do a check. So if the response is not okay, we're going to say we failed to fetch the user post and we know the endpoint we we're trying to fetch from isn't working. So then let's return the response.json. Okay, so this is the get users post function that's fetching dynamic data of every user's post. So we are exporting it, so we do need to import it inside of our parameter um, segment of our page JSX file. So we're gonna import it here at the top. So we're gonna import get user post from the libs. And then, like I said, we want to call this data in parallel. So I'm going to remove this H1 and I'm just going to say an H1 user information for now. And we can remove this because I'm going to show you how to fetch it in parallel. Okay. So we have both functions imported at the top. 
the next thing we want to do is we want to initiate both request in parallel. So we're not going to await the data. We just want to make sure the data gets initiated at the same time. So the first one was called user data. And that was equal to the get user passing in the param of ID. And the next one we could call user post. And it'll say the get user post passing in the param of ID to that function. Next we need to do a promise.all. So we're going to wait for both requests to complete, and we're going to call them at the same time with the destructuring of the user data and user posts. So it's going to look like this. We're going to have a user, and we're going to have a post, and then we're going to wait the promise for all of the user data and user posts, and we're going to give it to these individual variables. So now we are fetching data in parallel because we're fetching them at the same time. So that is how you do it. I could show you exactly it in action. So we could have a p tag saying username. And then we can map through the post if we want. So let's just do that real quick. So we're going to say post.map. We're going to have return. And then inside the return, we're going to have a key. We'll have the post title and close the p tag. And that's good enough for now because I just want to show the data because we're going to change this up real soon here. And then right behind this div, we're missing something here. Okay. So now let's check our localhost 3000. And let's go back to localhost 3000, the home page. We go to users, fetching all the users. We click Patricia. And as you can see, it says user information because that's our H1. We have Patricia. And then we have all of the post titles, which obviously is dummy data. It doesn't make any sense. But we are displaying everything. And as you can see, it loads so quick because my computer is pretty fast that the data loads at the same time. And if it both of the requests aren't fulfilled yet, it's going to wait for the other request to fulfill. So there is something we can do to make it a lot easier because like I said, some people's computers are slower. So the post, which is a bigger request to request from, like more data it's requesting, might take longer to load in than the, than the name. So the reason why we should use a suspense like a react suspense or a loading state is because we want to show the user a good experience and make sure that they know hey there's more data coming in it's just loading so what i'm going to do here is we are going to change this parallel fetching and we're going to use react suspense so before we use react suspense i want to make my data replicate a slow computer so to do that, I want to make sure that the user post comes in later than the actual other data that I'm, I'm going to call, which is the user information. So right above here, I'm going to have an await, and there'll be a new promise. And then I am going to set a timeout to this new promise. I like doing this in parentheses too. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a delay of three seconds. So that's why I put 3000. So we're going to delay this data for three seconds. And I don't think I removed anything yet. Yep. So we are fetching data in parallel. So I'm going to show you that all the data is going to take like three seconds to load. So let's try it again. Should we have Chelsea, Dietrich, and... As you can see, it, it's taking longer to load. I don't know if you could tell, like one, two, three. So I click it, one, two, three. So as you can see, it's taking a little longer to load because it's not going to load and show the information until all the data is loaded. And this isn't a good user experience. So what we need to do is we need to add the suspense, like I said. So we need to import suspense inside of our dynamic page at the top. It's in curly braces with the capital S. And we set a timeout of three seconds to the user post. So what we are going to do here is we are going to 
remove this promise at all and we could just call the first function which is await user data which is the user's data and we're calling a user so this information the user.name will display but we aren't awaiting the data for the post so we're going to get an error thrown so what i am going to do here is I'm going to create a component called user post. And what we are going to pass is a promise. And this is going to equal the user post. And this is a component which we haven't created, which we will create right now in a components folder. So create a components folder and then a file called user we could do a capital user post dot JSX RFC. It's called user post. And then we are going to, all we're going to do here is we're going to map through the information like we did there. And then we have to pass in the parameter, which we're passing in as a promise, which is user post. And we're passing it in as the value promise. So we must accept the promise up here. And then we can say const post equals await the promise. And then what we could do here is we could pass through and map through all of the posts and display them. So I just copied and pasted real quick here. And as you can see here, we're mapping through all the posts. We have a key of post ID. We're showing the post title and the post body. So now on the dynamic page with the brackets ID, we must import that component in here. So it is called user post from component slash user post. So what I want to do is I want to wrap the user post in suspense. And that means that it is going to have a fallback of a loading and the loading fallback. We could just do a P tag saying loading. So if the information doesn't display yet is just going to show a p tag saying loading and we could just do like a class name of text center and we could just do text 5 xl cool okay and i did like i remember i put a three second delay on the user post which the reason why is because we are getting the user post right we are passing into the variable user post and then we're passing the user post into the promise variable and then using it here. So let's look at our code. And we have a issue right here. Await isn't allowed in a non async function. So I forgot to put this function as async because we're using awake. Okay. So now when we go to our users, local host, we go to all of our users. We fetch all the users. When I click a person's name, we should see loading state like this, three seconds, and then we get all of the information. So that is how React Suspense works. If there is no data fetched, it will show the fallback of whatever you want to put. You could put a component, you could put a P tag, an H1, you could put whatever you want. So we could go back to the code just so you guys could see it again real quick, do what it looks like. All you do is wrap the component or the code with a suspense because if that code doesn't load in time, the suspense will take a place and it will use the fallback. And as you can see here, the get request for user seven took 3059 milliseconds, which is three seconds. So that is pretty much everything you need to know about Next.js 13 and data fetching within it. Let's go back over a few of the docs real quick. I do highly recommend you go over the docs yourself so you can learn more about Next.js 13 in general and also the data fetching. But if you do have any questions, hit, if you have any questions, comment them down below inside of the comment section and I will get back to you within hopefully 24 hours to answer anything. And in the meantime, if you have a question that needs answered and I'm not getting back to you quick enough, like I said, revisit the docs. The docs are very, very helpful and easy to understand. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I helped you a lot. 
with your learning and understanding of Next.js 13 data fetching. And with that said, if you can hit that like button and also subscribe for more content just like this, I would greatly appreciate it. So happy coding to all and have a great day.